We're going to be looking at Micah 3 tonight. Micah 3. Uh, Micah 3 is really a call to repentance. But one of the instructions uh, in Micah is the one that I'm using as my title. It's Seek Good, Hate Evil. And one of the things that uh, repentance does True repentance is going to end up with you seeking good and hating evil. And if you don't have that contrast in your life, then you have to re ask if you understand the extent of your sin and what it costs God. Because the only way to deal with sin, people, is to hate evil. Is to hate it and to seek good. So let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you today for your love and your grace. We ask that you come down in a powerful way and meet with us. We just thank you that you are God and that you want to meet us. You want to prepare us. You want us to come into that place with you of a true relationship with you. So I pray you prepare our hearts to come higher in you, to love you more, to serve you in ways that brings pleasure and honor to you. And so we thank you for this opportunity to look at your word tonight and to consider what's being said. And we just say this in your name. Amen. Now, remember, Micah had three messages to deliver. The first had to do with the predictions of judgment, which we looked at in chapters 1 and 2. The next message is going to take in chapters 3 through 5, and it has to do with the predictions of restoration. The final chapters... And the final message has to do with a plea for repentance before it's too late. Now, we are about to consider the second message, of course, which will be found in chapters, as I mentioned, 3 through 5 of Micah. And really, it stands at the heart of Micah because God wants, to under, wants his people to understand judgment in light of promise. We can get too caught up on judgment. Uh, but God wants us to see the promise so that we can avoid the judgment. One of the things about being Christians is our promise is in Christ. And it's an eternal promise with him. And God wants us to consider that promise in light of judgment. He wants us to uh, seek good and hate evil. He wants us to develop that attitude. And so uh, what you will see is that God is going to present this uh, prediction of restoration, which we already know has not really come yet. It has, began, it has begun to be fulfilled, but until Christ reigns as the Messiah, it will never be what we call a complete fulfilled prophecy. And so when he starts reigning as the Messiah, we know that all of these things that have been promised, the Jewish nation has finally been brought to completion. So you have to keep that in mind. Now, but before he brings out Israel's future, he is going to expound on something that's very important, and it has to do with rebuking the leaders of the nation for their sinful conduct. And we're going to see it begin in chapter 3. Because when we finally get to Mount Micah 5, we're going to see that the prophet will outline the events that would usher in the promised kingdom yet to come. But he has to deal with the leadership. Now, let me explain to something to you. You can have a king that can have revival, and you will end up with reformation. But revival, uh, revival for a nation is totally different. And it's not just a matter of a king repenting. It's a matter of all leaders repenting. All leaders showing that true repentance and brokenness before God and their people. If you consider Ezra, and we looked at Ezra, when Ezra was out there on his face repenting, that's when the people got real. And the problem in the days of Judah is that maybe one leader may have done something right, but the other leaders were not in step. 
And so without the full example of true repentance on the part of the leadership, uh, Micah knew that there would never be really true revival. There might be some reformation, but there would be no true revival on the people in themselves. And without true revival, they would just go back into the same old idolatry that they had reformed themselves from for a season. And so that's what he's going to get down to. He's going to be calling all of the leaders of Judah to repentance. And we're going to, he's going to be calling two leaders, two groups of leaders to repentance. And I may add that there's three groups he's going to talk to, but there is no room for repentance for the third group. And we're going to look at that group because it's pretty serious. And so uh, as we look at this, you have to keep that in mind. So look at how he's going to talk. And, and this is something that's very important because we want re revival in the church. But until we ta see all the leadership of the so-called church truly be broken over this sin and become an example to other people of true repentance, it's not going to happen. Because if you uh, follow every great revival from Finney, you go back even to some of the revivals that happened in China, it all started with the leadership being broken down, repenting of their sins in front of the rest of the people. And they were truly broken over that. They were truly broken over that, their sins. And so that's important to understand. People will reform under strong leaders who are revived with calling and line up to God, but revival really begins in God's people when all that leadership truly begins to seek good and hate evil and becomes that example. Now, one of the things you have to remember is that the promise surrounding the promised kingdom was brought forth to encourage the people to do one thing, and that's repent. That is repent. And Jesus was very clear. He says, repent or perish. It was that simple. It is God's will that he doesn't judge or bring wrath on the people's will that you repent. And that's his heart towards all people. But the problem is that people get stiff-necked. And they refuse to be broken. Now they may have a sign of self-pity, but it's not true brokenness. They may go around, oh, I know I'm a terrible person. But they haven't truly been broken both by their sin. They're just acting the part and playing the game. And when repentance truly happens, it happens in the area of the heart, not in our outward reformation or, or, or performance or whatever we do religiously. And that's a very important point. So it's not enough that the kings repent, but guess who else has to repent? The priest. The priests have to repent as well. They are the spiritual leaders of the place. And so God is, so Micah is calling both of these leaders, you need to repent. So that the people will understand the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of what's coming down on them. Because of the sins of the leadership and of the people. And so it's important to understand that. Our leaders need to get that, but they're not getting it. And I'm talking about the leaders not in our, nation, uh, in our capital, uh, because they're just lost, pathetic uh, sons of Bilal, a lot of them. I'm talking about people who call themselves Christians. I'm talking about leaders, elders, pastors, whoever. They need to truly be broken and repent over the sins that are happening in the church today. Now, the people must see leadership broken over sin, leadership trembling before a holy God, leadership seeking mercy to avoid dying in sins. This is not about changing the country. This is about changing hearts. It's about people not dying in their sins. So it's in light of these uh, future promises 
uh, of the Kenan that people of Judah and people of Israel had much to look forward to. And they had a reason to repent. You know what? We have a reason to repent. It's called heaven. We have a reason to repent. It's called heaven. And he was giving these people a reason to repent. But unless a person's heart is truly ready to be broken and to come to a place of repentance, they're not going to repent. It's, it's just how it is. Now, many po people find false hope to hang on to their wishful thinking. Oh, we're okay. As they live in denial about what the prophet warned, what the people as far as the judgment coming at them. You know, we have the word of God, the greatest prophet, Jesus, told us about the end days. He told us what was going to happen. He told us how many of us believe it. How many of us are preparing our life for what's coming down the line because we believe it. We know it's going to happen. And all the wishful thinking is not going to change that. Every pulpit today in America should be warning the people. And if they're not, they're failing the people. Let me just say that every pulpit in America should be warning the people of the judgment ready to come upon them on their sin if they do not repent. But we don't hear that, do we? Now, Micah is, is ready to try to warn them, okay? He's trying to warn them. So let's look at verse 1 and see what he says. And I said, notice what the prophet said, hear. Oh, that's an important word. Hear what I'm about to tell you. I am not just making a bunch of noise. I am trying to warn you. So you need to hear it. You need to perceive what I'm taking. You need to believe it. Hear it. There's a lot of messages going out today. You have to discern them. But if it's from God, may I say, hear it. Hear it. Perceive it as to what's being said. Because it's trying to warn you against the day that's coming upon America, upon the whole world. So he's saying, hear, okay? These leaders needed to hear what God was saying to them. What was Jesus' instruction? We talked about it today. To hear what the Spirit is saying. Because the Spirit is going to lead us into all truth about Christ, but it's also going, He's going to warn us of, of things to come. That's in John 16, 13. We need to hear what the Spirit is saying. We need to open our ears and say, God, I want to hear. We need to be like Samuel. We hear him in the Scripture. Lord, here I am. Tell me what you want me to know. Because I want to be prepared. I don't want to live in wishful thinking and ignore it. I want to be ready. Because guess what? That's what our Bible says. Be ready. Be watchman. Be ready. Occupy until I come, but be ready. So he's telling them here. And likewise, this generation needs to hear. We need to hear. So what have you heard lately? Is God speaking to you? Are you hearing him? Are you ignoring him? Are you believing what he says? Is it lining up to the word of God? Then we need to believe it. It's that simple. So he says, O oh, heads of Jacob. What's he talking about? The leadership. And you princes of the house of Israel. Talking about the leadership. Is it not for you to know judgment? He says, Isn't, wouldn't it be wise for you to know what's coming down the line so you could protect your people, so that you could prepare your people, so you could intercede? Wouldn't it be a wise thing for you to know? The judgment of God is coming down? That's a simple question. So it's clear at this, as we will see, Michael 
And Micah is talking to civil authorities as well as we will see the priest down the line. So he's going to bring the indictment against them, what they're guilty of. Verses 2 and 3. He says, who hate the good. The first thing is they hated good. They hated good. And love the evil because it served their purposes, okay? Who plucked off their skin from off of them and their flesh from off their bones. Who also eat the flesh of my people. Flay their skin from bones and chop them in pieces as for their the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. Now that is pretty tough. What What is he saying to them? He says you are basically taking my people for a ride. You are having them for dinner. You are stripping them of everything they have. You're skinning them. And if that's not enough, you're leaving their bones out to dry. These leaders were totally robbing the people of Israel. They were totally taking advantage. They were totally exploiting them. Do we see people like that in our government? Aren't they willing to strip us of everything and leave, you know, and, and pick our bones and leave us out there to dry? It's called communism and socialism, and we have a bunch of fools who think that's going to work. But it's not. So here we have the reality of it. We're seeing a lot of the same leadership in our own country. That's doing and willing to do the same thing to the people. And in some cases have been doing it to the people. And I'm not only talking about civil authorities. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about these charlatans in church. That have big mansions. And have robbed the widows. And have stolen. I'm talking about them too. And we're going to see that the prophet's going to talk about them and what he's going to say. And you know, if I was them, I'd be shaking in my shoes. So here we come down to uh, the next one. Uh, and, and first of all, I also need to point out, it says to hate the good, love the evil. Uh, Keep in mind what Amos said. This is interesting, and we know Amos lived during this time too, and so did Isaiah. We read some of the very same things today in Isaiah. And what it says in Amos 5, 14, 15, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. What is he saying? If you're not seeking good, you're not going to live. And then he goes on, So the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as he has spoken. Hate the evil, love the good, and establish judgment in, in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant. Call them remnant of Jacob. Because he knew it was only going to be a remnant. So we know that Isaiah talked about calling good evil, evil good. He talked about, as we read in 28 this morning, he talked about the same type of condition going on. So this was not just one prophet. This was all the prophets coming out with the same message. God was saying the same thing. I want you to consider what Proverbs 8.13 says because it gives us a contrast. It says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's the fear of the Lord. Job hated evil. It says so and he had the fear of the Lord. And arrogancy. You are to hate the arrogant sea of people. We see so much arrogancy in some of our leaders in Washington, D.C. One is as Speaker of the House. He says, you're to hate that. And then he goes in the, you're to hate the evil way. You're to hate the evil way. And then he says, the forward mouth do I hate. God hates the forward mouth. 
a lying, perverted mouth that tries to change the reality of something. So we have the very same situation today. These leaders fleeced the sheep, they skinned them alive, they exploited them in every possible way, every level, from transactions in the gate to the seat of judgment. They were exploiting them. So these, these leaders came across as, as ravious, ravenous beasts, I'm trying to get that out, that picks even the bones dry. This is what they were doing, leaving nothing. They devoured the people in every way they could. They took advantage of every situation they could to get the most out of it for themselves. They left nothing behind. So let's look at four. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. Because what's, what's going to come with all this judgment? And there's going to be a day they cry out to the Lord. And what does it say? I'm not going to hear them. I'm not going to hear them at all. They are going to taste the bitter dregs of judgment. I'm not going to hear them. He says, he will, but he will not hear them. He will even, what? Hide his face from them at that time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. He's going to turn totally away, totally away from them. He's not going to regard them. He's not going to care about their cries. I will tell you what God will hear. He will hear the cries of the oppressed. He will hear the cries of the widows. And I have no doubt this time he's heard the cries of the oppressed people. And he's ready to bring judgment on those who have oppressed them. And you know what? He's going to react to their cries the same way as they reacted to the cries of the people they oppressed. They ignored it. They turned their backs on them. And he's going to do it to them. They will reap what they sow. It's that simple. So now here comes the third group. He's dealt with the civil authorities. He's dealt with the, the kings and the priests in a way. Because the priests were just as guilty. We're going to get into that. Now he's going to deal with the third group. And basically, he doesn't call them to repentance. They're just going to be put into judgment. And who are they? They're the false prophets. How serious is it to be a false prophet? There's greater condemnation. There's greater condemnation on a false prophet. And today we have a lot of them running around. They're on TV. They've been allowed in churches to sell heresy, false prophecies, wrong teachings. They're false prophets. So how is, how, what is God going to do with these wonderful false prophets? Okay. And there's another thing I want you to know. The false prophets are very secular too. They say it's okay. Sin's okay. They tell people what they want to hear. We're where we're at today because of false prophets. In our government. In our churches. And we're in a terrible situation. We were talking about New York today. About the abortion situation. And as I said, you know what? I asked the Lord to bring judgment on New York because uh, the unborn babies don't have a platform. It's not that people aren't trying to fight for the rights of the unborn baby because we have Jay Sekulow, we have lawyers out there trying to fight, but the world has become so wicked it's taken away every platform. You do not hear this battle on TV at all. 
And you know what's even worse? A lot, not all of them, but a lot of our leaders are silent. They're not, they're not bringing a decry. They're not crying against what happened in New York. I don't hear them at all. Do you? I don't hear them at all. And I'm sitting there and I said, Lord, these children don't have very much of a voice because there's no platform. But you know something? I know the God of heaven. I'm going to ask you, Lord, to bring judgment. And it may disrupt my life, but you need to bring judgment because enough is enough. I'm their voice and I am standing before God Almighty and I am saying Lord I'm the voice of every unborn child and this is stepping across a line of no return and so I have asked the Lord to bring judgment on them and of course I was sharing how uh, they were, the 9-11 Memorial Tower was used to light up to celebrate it too. And I thought, you're coming down. The very tower that celebrate, that recognizes 3,000, over 3,000 dead Americans are celebrating how many millions of abortions? 100,000, how many? I can't remember so many. We lost track. It is a disgrace. It needs to come down. What a sham against something that's supposed to re represent the sacredness of lives that were lost in duty. And so I sit there with my head and I just say, Lord, I just can't stand it. And as I was sitting there, I realized those justices who voted for Roe versus Way are in hell today. And the torment and the uh, destruction that happens to a baby in the womb is happening to them. Only multiply it for every unborn child that has been offered to the wretched gods of America all these years from 1973. God will hear the, uh, the cries of the oppressed. He will even avenge for them. But he will not hear the cries of the oppressed. And we're here because of false prophets. We're here because we believe the lie. We're here because we believe Satan's cronies. We're here as a nation because we wanted an easy way around sin. Instead of facing it. And calling it what it is. These people have be, be, betrayed themselves carefully. And it all comes down to false prophets. Because they feed into the narrative. So let's look at what it says in 5. It says, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. Look at it. He says, they make my people err. That bite with their teeth and cry, peace. And he that putteth not unto their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Now, what's he saying? These prophets went around and basically told lies that fed the narrative, and they kept saying peace when war was on the, the horizon. What does it say about in the Bible before a great time of tribulation comes? They will be saying peace, peace. And then sudden destruction will come on them. They were doing the same thing back there. Oh, it's peace, peace, peace. God's not going to let this happen to you. But it was going to happen. And all the time they were planning war against who? God, his truth, his prophets. They were planning a war against the righteous. They wanted to shut up the prophets. They want to silence God. They want to say his word doesn't fit, doesn't apply. What nice people they were. Was God impressed with them? I don't think so. 
So what will happen to the prophet's vision? Because re remember, they get visions. Who they get them from, though? Satan. They get visions. So what's going to happen to their vision? Look at 6. Therefore, night shall be unto you that you shall have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you that you shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. What does it mean? He's not going to let them see anything. They're going to see darkness. You know what he's basically going to do? He's going to silence their familiar spirits. That's all he's going to do. He's going to silence their familiar spirits. Not, there's not going to be any information coming to them. It's going to be darkness for them. In fact, they will find themselves groping in spiritual darkness, trying to find something to justify their very existence. So look at 7. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. Wow. He's silencing the familiar spirits. And so those seers, which were sometimes called prophets too, what did it say about them? Where well, they're going to be ashamed. What do you think is going to happen to every false prophet? in America, whether on a secular basis or in our church, when everything that they have prophesied proves to be contrary, and the things happen, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be brought to total shame. They're going to be brought to total shame. And the people are going to turn around and point their fingers at them. And they're going to say, well, what's your problem? That's what you asked for. That's what you wanted. You didn't want the truth. What's going to happen to the diviners or the mediums or the, those who operate in witchcraft? What's going to happen to them? I like this too. They're going to be confounded. They're going to be confused. They're going to be silenced because... They can't read it. They can't hear it. They can't know it. And so that they can spread their lies. They're going to be confounded. And what are they all going to do? Well, they're all going to cover their lips. For there's no answer coming from God. You see, when you become confounded or you become overwhelmed, who do you turn to usually? The right source. Don't you? When you see something coming on the horizon and you don't understand it, you're going to turn to what source? The right source. Is God going to say anything? No. He's going to be silent to him. He's not going to rebuke him. He's not going to tell him, you know what? I told you you were wrong. God doesn't say, I told you so. So that's what's happening here with these wonderful, wonderful false prophets. Now, guess who steps on the scene? The real thing, the real prophet. What does he say? He's going to bring a contrast. This is verse 8. But truly... I am full of the power by the Spirit of the Lord. He says, I have power and of judgment. I have the judgment. God has given me the judgment. You need to know. And of might. I have the authority to do it. To declare unto Jacob his transgression and Israel his sin. Now, this is very important, the two words he used. Uh, because Jacob is associated with the law. Judah is associated with the law. And because they're associated with the law, they have transgressed the law. That's why he calls it transgression. Where Israel, the other part, the ten tribes, walked away from the law. They walked away from God and began to chase after 
other idols. And what does he say to them? Sin. Your sin. Your practices. Your rejection of God. Your rebellion. Sin. So here he comes again. Hear this. Oh, well, he's saying it again. I pray you. He's almost beseeching them. You heads of the house of Jacob and the princes of the house of Israel, that what you abhor judgment and pervert what? All justice or equality is basically what that's making reference to. He's telling them, you know what? You have, you have abhorred true judgment. And you have, you have uh, perverted all justice, all fairness. And he's talking to the leaders at this point. Now I want you to see what he says. And this is, this just sort of made me want to, it sort of became like, wow. Verse 10. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. They shed the blood. They were blood guilty of shedding innocent blood. No doubt running children, presenting children to the false gods and idols. No doubt killing people in order to get their lands. No doubt uh, operating in such a way that innocent blood was shed and Zion was built on it. Their prosperity was built on it. But what about Jerusalem with iniquity? Iniquity is that moral deviation from what is true, what is right. Moral deviation from the moral law. That's how you have built Jerusalem with your iniquity with deviation from what's right, and you should have known differently. So we're going to get down to what their problem was, okay? Because one of the problems that we see is the reason they did this. Why did they do this? Why did they think that they could get away with this? Was it the priests, uh, the kings, the false prophets? Why did they think they could get away with it because they could not see God destroying the city his temple they could not see God bringing down his chosen people they couldn't see it you see they made it about them being Jewish and not about God they didn't understand how God works he doesn't need us okay he doesn't need us and so they figured well, hey, look, God's not going to bring us down because you know what? The future king's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. We have all those promises. We're the promised people. He's not going to destroy us. So, you know, we'll tell the people what they want to hear. Who cares? We'll give them what they want to hear. And for what? For money. It's called money. How many prophets are we to have today tickle the ears and tell us what we want to hear? Why? Because they get bread. You know what Jesus said? He said, you're following me because I can give you bread. You're not following me because I'm truth. You're not following me because I'm the way. You're not following me because I can give you life. You follow me so you can have bread. And that's what the bottom line is. People sell their soul for bread. So let's look at this. Because they, had, they were foolish to think that they could put God to a foolish test. Here we come. Down to a great indictment. The heads thereof judge for reward. 
the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord to say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Do we hear that today? Oh, God loves you. God loves you. God's not going to do anything with you. Oh, well, we're, we're his children. He's our daddy. I've heard it all. And it makes me want to throw up. It makes me want to throw up. So what do we have here? I think about it. The judges could be bribed. The priests were for hire. In other words, if you pay me enough money, I'll come and do whatever for you. I'll release you of whatever sin. I'll do whatever. Uh, what major church does that? Major religion has a priest for hire. And then we have, um, we also have, what else do we have? We have the prophets there of divine for money as well. How many uh, false prophets are out there trying to get money from everybody? Give me money and you'll get a blessing. God doesn't work that way. His blessings aren't for sale. I remember what Peter said. He talked about merchandising of souls in 2 Peter 2, 3. And then in 1 Peter 5, 2 through 3, he said something. He said, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, being examples to the flock. So what's God's opinion of all of this? Well, he's not, he's not happy about it. He's not happy about it. And they thought they could get away with it. And people get away, and they get away with it because the people want to hear it. They don't want the truth. The people will pay them for a lie. They prefer the lie. They love darkness for their deeds are evil. And the prophets will justify them in those evil deeds. And they'll make them content and happy going to hell. But let's look at 12. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountains of the house as the high uh, places of the forest. God wasn't among them. His presence had lifted. And he will allow his people to go into captivity, to chastise them, chastise them. He will allow his city to be brought down and purged. And he will allow his temple to be totally destroyed. To show his witness isn't there anymore. His presence isn't there anymore. He will do that, people. And ultimately, he will judge the leaders. He will judge them. I want to tell you today, uh, I think that New York is going to be under greater judgment. Great judgment. I don't know how. I don't know in what way. But they're going to be in, under great judgment. But you know who has a greater damnation? Those Infidels standing back there calling themselves clergy and smiling in the green, they have a greater damnation. And those judges who pass Roe versus Wade, however, they're in a hot place, a very, very, very hot place. But those clergies that call themselves Christians condone murdering children are going to be in a worse hell and a worse fire before it's over. And there's not going to be any laughing or smiling. Now the reality of it is, his people were corrupted. His leaders had perverted judgment. 
His prophets were lying. The prophets were lying. They weren't his. Now, the problem with people, and this is true for the church, the problem with the Jewish people is they think, they thought, well, God cannot move us out of the land. He cannot do this because then he can't fulfill his promise. What they didn't realize is that if this generation is a mess, because it's not about the Jewish people, it's about God being holy. If this generation is a total mess, he will choose another generation. He will let this generation die in the wilderness like he did in the uh, great exodus from Egypt. He let a whole generation die in the wilderness and it was the new generation that inherited the promises. Today, as I watch this generation coming up, they call them millennials, whatever you want to call them. There are some decent ones. Don't get me wrong. But I'm going to tell you, I believe that the torch is going over the millennial generation to another generation that's coming up. And I've seen them on TV. And they seem to have got it. And I think it's because their parents are involved and in telling them. And what these little cupcakes don't realize, God doesn't need them. And if they want to go down the road to slaughter as stupid, dumb, slaughter sheep, ready to be slaughtered, they will. But God will always have a remnant, and he will go to the next generation. And that's what those false prophets didn't understand. God didn't need their generation. He would preserve Israel, and out of that would come a new generation that one day would inherit the promises of God. And they might be a remnant, but nevertheless, they're going to line up to a holy God. And that's what we're seeing. People in church say, oh, God, he, he wouldn't destroy the church. He, he, you know, he wouldn't do that. No, God has a remnant. And he will raise up another generation of people who will do, call people to repentance and declare the truth in boldness. Now, we can become foolish and put God to a foolish task as these people were doing. But in the end, God will prove what we all know. He is holy. He means what he says and he will purge his people so that they will come forth as a holy nation. The truth is, God does not need us. He will not accept our crumbs. And he will not ignore our sins.